Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is Fantasy Talk and my name is Chase and today I'm here to discuss The Way of Kings. So this book is book one of the Stormlight Archive, which is Brandon Sanderson's grand epic in his Cosmere universe. So this is going to be a 10 book series. This is book one. There'll be two five part series, each kind of having their own rounded out conclusion and everything like that. So there is not a whole lot that I can probably add to what has already been said about this book. It's one of the most massively popular fantasy books of the last 10 years. It has been talked about ad nauseum. So what I really want to say is if you have not read this book before, here's some things that you should know and here's some things that well should make you want to read this book. So the first thing is this book does sometimes get criticized for being kind of slow for the first seven to eight hundred pages. So for me, I didn't have any problem with this book at all. First of all, as a reader myself, I don't have a problem with most first books of series because there's so much new to take in. There's so much world building, new characters to try to remember. I usually feel entertained and engaged just by the process of trying to keep track of everything that's happening. And it really depends on what kind of reader you are or what, what you have on your schedule. If you have 10 books that you want to get to really, really badly, and then you get to this and you say, yeah, I'll try it. You're probably not going to have a good time because you're just going to be constantly thinking, when can I get to that next book? So you kind of do have to commit to this book, but it is completely worth it. There is a huge payoff. You will be paid off for everything in this book. It may not be in this book, it may be in the next book or the third book. I'd say 70% of what's in this book, you will get a huge payoff for and just totally worth it. it. People say that for a reason. This book is intense on character examination for the three main characters, which are Shalon, Dalinar, and Kaladin. Shalon is kind of a naive girl who grew up pretty wealthy and she's been sheltered her whole life. Kaladin is a slave who has been enslaved for reasons and is traveling to the Shattered Plains where there is a current war going on. And that's where he's headed to basically become slave labor for the army. Dalinar is basically an advisor to the king. He is the king's uncle. He's a former warlord and he is having visions and things that he can't be sure that he can even trust his mind anymore. And so you basically with these three characters, you're going on a journey with them and it is a intense day to day journey. For some people with there not being a ton of action in there, it can get a little repetitive or boring. But let me frame it this way. Have you ever been reading a series? For me, it was Lord of the Rings. And in that series, you wished that you could have spent more time with those characters in their day-to-day -day lives. You know, I always wanted to spend more time with Aragorn and Gandalf and all these people, Boromir, Legolas, that we didn't see as much of. And we just kind of skirted over because it, that wasn't the focus of the story, but I always wanted to spend more time with them. So think of the series that you've ever thought that with. I want to see what it was like. I want more time in the world. I want to see this corner of the world that they didn't show me. That's what you're getting with The Way of Kings. You are getting that day-to-day -day life with these characters. You're getting to explore these corners of the world. And for me, that's super engaging and super fascinating. Now, I've been critical of Brandon in the past about how he spends too much time in what I call character exposition, where we're getting too deep into the characters' minds. We know too fully every thought that they're having, every which way that they all seem like they are hyper planners and very analytical. And I don't think that's true for every person. You know, some people are more impulsive. Some people are more evaluating and trying to be judgmental of which path to take. For Brandon, it seems like 80 to 90% of his characters are that planning type. And for me, it just feels like it's a little too much getting into the characters. With that being said, this book and the following books after it still have some of the best character work. I think it is Brandon's style done at its best that he's ever done. Now, I've talked a lot about how the book is slow, but that's not to say that there are not crazy action scenes, that there are not super engaging moments. And it's not just the action, there are emotional payoffs that are just quiet moments that come from investing your time reading the rest of the book. This book is like a rock opera. It's like Pink Floyd's The Wall, where there's interludes, there's things that you won't understand from the beginning until you get to the very end, you've completed the book. The final thing I'll say in the spoiler-free section is this is a book where I read it in January and it's been a long time since I've read it. Now listen to the audiobook sometime in between then and now. Sometimes I find myself thinking like, was it really that good? And then I'll start just kind of going through, well, okay, what happened in the book? And then I start spiraling into memory of everything that happened and just the grand scale and I just become kind of like in shock. So somehow, if you have not read this story and you are a fantasy lover, give it a shot. You are doing yourself a favor. All right, so for the spoiler section, I just want to do 10 quick hitting questions about the Way of Kings. So 
So I think a lot of people would probably go with either Kaladin, Dalinar, or Shallan, but not me. I have a super soft spot for this character, and she is actually one of my favorite characters in all of fantasy. She's definitely in my top 10, and that is Sylphrena. She's loyal, she's kind. Honestly, I don't think Kaladin really deserves her. She's just too good, and I love a companion character that is basically just through it thick and thin with the main character who is not necessarily deserving of their friendship, but they stick around anyway because they're just the best. There are a ton of different things to choose from here, and I know that there are probably more popular choices, and there are scenes that are more evocative and things like that. But the one that was the most emotionally poignant for me, and I just love it so much, is when Syl brings the little poison plant flower leaf thing to Kaladin when he's considering ending his life at the chasms, and she doesn't understand that it is poison like he could just eat it and die. But it's just the gesture and the way that Kaladin responds, it brings him back from the brink. So I just listened to this on audiobook probably a week ago. So I may have like some recency bias, but thinking back to even the prologue, the ending of the book, any scene in between, I feel like this was actually the best like contained written action sequence by Brandon. And that is Zeth killing the king of Yakaved, because you had two shard bearers, you had the people with the half shards, the way Zeth, seeing it through his eyes and how he was feeling in that moment. I just love it so much and the very final moment of that scene where he stabs into the face of the king is really brutal. Like This is some of the most brutal stuff that Brandon has written and it's just really well done. That is going to be obvious, it is Rock. Rock is Kaladin's Rock. He is somebody who I want to be my friend and I want him to cook me stew. And yeah, he can put the clamshells in the stew. I'm down for it. This one's easy. It's Sadius. He's a piece of shit. So I think after reading the first book, but before reading the sequels, I would have said Shallan would have been the most intriguing. But now that that's answered, I would say Zeth is the most intriguing. And I'm really hopeful that book five is going to be his flashback sequence because why is he truthless? You know, how did he get an honor blade? All this kind of stuff. And after the reveal in Oathbringer, the mind-melting one, that made me just completely view the series in a whole new light, I'm even more interested to get his backstory because I feel like that will give us some answers. It's the Sprin, hands down. So when I first read, the Sprin were so alien to me, like I didn't know what the hell was going on, and it just makes the story feel so alive, like Pain Sprin. Like some of the art that's been done with the Pain Sprin where they're just clawing out of the ground and just the colors that the sprint add to the world and how people just take them for granted but it's just really really cool and i love how it ties in with brandon's whole cognitive realm and everything like that i can see why this would make it really hard to adapt because it would almost have to be an animated show because you have to be able to draw all these sprint but if they ever could do it in a live adaptation they did it well it could be some of the most just amazing breathtaking visuals so this for me goes to Teravangian, and it only gets more so in the next two books. And the whole thing about his intelligence, I just really am fascinated with his character. I think in this first series of five books, he actually may end up being my favorite villain. So this one I think is easy. It's going to be the Day of Recreants. Just was so moving. I think the reveal in Oathbringer only serves to make that even more emotionally hard hitting. Moash. 